Hi, everyone. I'm Tony Baranowski of the Cedar Rapids Gazette. I'd like to welcome you to our second session in the healthcare track of this year's Iowa Ideas. Our topic today is a big one that spans Iowa and beyond protecting Iowa's healthcare workers. I want to start off by recognizing our presenting sponsor, ITC Midwest, who has been with us since the very beginning of Iowa Ideas and continues to be a partner that believes in the power of these conversations of journalism and of moving our communities forward in positive directions. Now, I just wanna turn it over to our panelists for this conversation to introduce themselves, a little bit about their background and their connection to this issue. Let's uh, start off with Claude. Hi, I'm Claude Howard Jr., uh, currently the Director of Behavioral Health, uh, Inpatient Behavioral Health Services, Security and Environmental Safety with Mercy Medical Center in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, background is 17 plus years in law enforcement, um, also in social service for a couple of years prior to that. Uh, I'm in my ninth year now at Mercy Medical Center um, working at the hospital. Okay. Thanks, Tony, uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Abai Nadipuram. I'm the Chief Legal Officer for the Iowa Hospital Association. The Iowa Hospital Association is the trade association for every hospital in the state of Iowa. Uh, we've been in existence for uh, 95 years uh, and uh, just actually celebrated our 95th uh, uh, uh annual meeting. Um, so thank you to all of our members for being there uh, and also uh, being very, very vigilant on this topic. Um, uh, I'm a, I was a formerly a litigator in private practice. Uh, I also served as the chief legal officer for care initiatives, which is Iowa's largest uh, nonprofit nursing home provider. I've been here since November of 2022. Um, my role here uh, uh, at the hospital association is to not only uh, support uh, the legal, uh, lead the legal department here and support the association with its legal needs, but um, also work on uh, issues that are uh, facing our members uh, right now. Uh, one of those top issues is certainly uh, trying to reverse the trend uh, of uh, increased incidents of workplace violence in hospitals. So looking forward to the discussion today and thank you to the Gazette for having us. Thank you for joining us. Molly, you're up. Hi, I'm Molly Mackey. I'm the Chief Learning Officer of the Leadership Institute. I work with healthcare associations, human service organizations, and associations all around the U.S. to provide leadership training for folks, also soft skills training and trauma-informed de-escalation training. All right, that's great. So we have uh, a lot of different perspectives on this topic, um, people who are put feet on the ground, and, and uh, I understand dealing with the issue as we speak uh, this morning. Um, now let's let's start off our discussion, but by just talking about what what the state of what is going on in on this topic right now. Um, I, you hit on this a little bit that uh, you know there are some troubling trends, and um, I I think the the logical jumping off point here. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, well, uh, you know, here at the Hospital Association, one thing that we do uh, pretty regularly is survey our members. And um, we also have a large data program here. Where we're able to collect a lot of data, uh, not only on the clinical side, but also on the workforce side. And in our uh, 2023 uh, workplace violence uh, survey uh, that we conducted, um, uh, hospitals uh, uh, like uh, where Claude works at Mercy Medical Center responded and said that in the last 12 months, uh, there were over 3,600 incidences of workplace violence uh, in our hospitals. And we know that's an underreported figure, as Claude can speak to, uh, and Molly can speak to a little bit about why that happens here in a little bit. But that's everything from verbal in intimidation to being kicked, punched, threatened with violence, spit on, uh, pinched, uh, hit by uh, thrown objects. And uh, because of that, uh, as Claude will talk about here a little bit, a lot of security measures have had to be put in place at a, at a high cost for our hospitals, uh, including having to install panic buttons, uh, uh, determine how to uh, instill late lockdown capabilities, um, decrease the number of entrances, uh, pay for 24-hour security, which can be very costly and uh, is certainly cost prohibitive for a lot of our smaller hospitals in, in rural Iowa. Um, and of course, increase signage to remind people that it's not okay uh, to commit violence in our hospitals. Now, we've uh, been fortunate that we do have a lot of partner partners from the uh, 
outside of our walls that have helped with that, uh, helped reverse the trend here, including law enforcement, county attorneys, uh, contract security staff, uh, homeland security as well that provides training. And we actually have some updated numbers as of uh, last month um, from July, 2023 to June, 2024, uh, our, our hospitals res uh, responded to a survey that said that um, just during the time frame alone, there were 1600 total workplace violence incidences. So um, again, the trend doesn't seem to be uh, uh, reversing uh, uh, as we anticipated. Um, uh, uh, after uh, people sort of started returning to hospitals on a regular basis. Um, and as Claude can attest to, um, there are a lot of ways that um, individual hospitals are, are working on the issue. But um, some of the issues, solutions we'll talk about today will be how we can maybe provide some more tools to our county attorneys to help uh, deal with this issue, uh, and certainly how we can provide some more education to uh, frontline workers uh, to ensure that the, the law is enforced. Molly, do you have some perspective on uh, how Iowa uh, compares nationally on this topic and, and what's going on? Uh, are there states where uh, we're seeing the trend uh, headed the right direction? That's really interesting because each state tackles this differently. Um, when I was doing research, we did a, a five city tour with Iowa Hospital Association talking about workplace violence committees, de-escalation, et cetera. And one of the states that's been a little bit more successful is Oregon, and they've got some very specific things that they do as far as requiring de-escalation training, requiring very specific things that hospitals do. Um, we know in Iowa, there's not any specific requirements for de-escalation training. There are suggestions you, when you're not required to have a workplace violence committee. It's interesting. I work with some human service folks in Nebraska, and as of 2025, all of their folks have to have de-escalation training. So it really is kind of a piecemeal state by state. All right. Um, I think uh, you, you touched on this, Abai, but can we talk a little bit about causation um, and uh, why we're seeing uh, these numbers escalate right now? Um, I, th I, I mean, I think just like uh, pretty much every professional environment, um, people are adjusting, still adjusting to a new normal. And, and is that part of what we're seeing uh, in emergency rooms and other healthcare facilities? Yeah, I'm going to start off and then uh, if it's okay, I throw it over to Claude to talk about some of the specifics, but I think there are a couple of general things and, and Claude can touch on specifics here. But um, I think number one, all of our hospitals um, and all of healthcare in Iowa, I think is experience, uh, experiencing sh uh, staffing shortages. And um, that's uh, uh, certainly in light of the pandemic, um, there were a lot of retirements, retirements accelerated, we know significantly uh, after the pandemic. And so there are just fewer people um, to do, uh, in fact, more work. Um, and so part of that is so wait times are longer. And I think people are just less patient. It's not just in the hospital setting. I think it's in the retail setting and the restaurant setting. Uh, and I think that is some uh, uh, something society, from a societal perspective uh, we, we need to uh, uh, address and deal with. Um, I think another side of this, which I'd like Claude to kind of touch on a little more specifically, is we're just in our hospitals are just seeing uh, more uh, patients with behavioral health, underlying behavioral health um, uh, uh, medical diagnoses that are untreated for long periods of time. Uh, and uh, there are fewer places for those people to go to get um, you know, long uh, standing assistance uh, to making sure that they, they stay on track. So uh, you know, I think those are the two uh, areas, uh, two main buckets. Claude, can you maybe jump into the specifics there? Yeah, I, I definitely I think you're right. And I, I think that, um, you know, one of the because of the the lack of um, residential services, there's definitely been a, a decrease in that in Iowa. Um, we you know, there's the inpatient beds are also less. And because of that, we end up having to push patients with some some mental or behavioral health issues um, into some more of our um, common floors, medical floors, where there's less training, uh, less information and education on how to deal with someone that's going through a mental health crisis or 
someone who's living with dementia or someone who is, um, you know, dealing with some severe behavioral health uh, related issues. And and I think that probably there's a little bit of causality there with with increases and in spikes in um, workplace violence events. Um, you know, here at Mercy, we we do have a workplace violence committee. Um, I've I we definitely um, require some de-escalation training, um, and I I offer that and, and teach that myself here with a program that I wrote for Mercy. But um, we we definitely have pockets of and departments where um, we we require that training for for our staff, um, especially um, places where we know there would might be a high rate of persons that are dealing with with a mental health crisis. And and I, yeah, society it has has changed quite a bit. I mean, you know, post pandemic. Um, it's been a bit of a struggle, uh, but I also think, you know, when, you know, that health care worker fatigue, so to speak, it's difficult to understand, I think, how to engage with people today. Um, and, and, and what's correct is there is a little bit less patience. Um, and we and the thing that we can do, I think, to help this is to is to reteach those types of things. I think that we need to to really sit down with our teams and our staff to reeducate them on better ways to proactively approach um, escalating incidents um, how to engage with people in a, in a little different way, um, in a better way, and kind of get back to, to where we're helping people feel comfortable coming to us right away rather than responding all the time. Because I think, unfortunately, when we get into a response situation consistently, um, then we're never necessarily creating that rapport that we need with patients to, to kind of de-escalate those situations. We're always just responding to an escalated situation that then, of course, escalates us um, because it's difficult to, to shed that. Um, in the moment. So um, a, a lot of work probably needs to be done. And I think that we just need to take a different approach. Physical security is one thing, but honestly, it's the person to person interaction that's going to make the difference in driving down workplace violence events. And and I think we've shown that a little bit here at, at Mercy. We've been able to drive those numbers down a little bit just through um, creating some initiatives and then also really um, talking about um, how important the engagement is with our with our patients. And I, I definitely want to get into some more of the specifics of where you guys have had success at Mercy, Claude. But uh, for the time being, right now, we're kind of talking about this uh, as workplace violence in general. Let's think about what um, the ripple effects are of this issue in healthcare specifically mm -hmm. and, and why it's why it's so important that we have a session dedicated to it uh, today during Iowa Ideas. Um, the the impact of uh, how this um, affects every facility and and every patient, not to mention the the professionals. Yeah, I, I definitely think that there's a ripple effect out, and what I see now that I'm in, also have a clinical unit, you know, outside of security. The difficulty of sitting down with someone who wants to get into the healthcare field and, and has some a potential desire to be um, in that mental health space um, sees a lot of the things that are going on. And, and when a lot of the reports are workplace violence is up and you're going to get, you know, you might get smacked, you might get kicked, you might get violent, all these things, I think we're probably starting to move um people unfortunately away from we we need healthcare workers, you know, and we need to be able to promote that. But again, I, I think part of that is is understanding that that trend is is drawing people away from some of those types of um, like patient, direct patient care um, jobs that we really need people to to do. But the workplace violence part is real. And so, um, I, and people know that now where we talk about it all the time and, and people hear about it all the time. Um, and so we, I think that's one of the things that we really need to focus on, which is, you know, how do we, how do we maybe, um, normalize the the need for the education and training and and bring that into the universities and the in the you know uh, programs the degree programs where um, people can understand how to de-escalate situations they can get some of that education early they can understand what to really expect and and know that uh you know it's it's important for them to have that education before they get into the job place and you know one other thing is interesting uh and we talked about this a little bit during our prep session uh, but um there are just so many more options for healthcare workers these days. Uh, you know, back maybe 
uh, 15 years ago, or maybe even 10 years ago, you know, if you're going to go work at a hospital, you're, you know, pretty much you're going to work in a, in, in an inpatient or, and that's, you know, that was going to be your work, but there are hospitals have expanded their, not their, their services. There are many more outpatient services and clinics that are available. I mean, you know, my wife's a physician and one of her med school classmates, um, is a hospitalist, but is entirely remote. Uh, provides care to and uh, to patients entirely from you know his home uh, and uh, so I, I think it, that's an important thing for us and another challenge that I think you know Claude and his peers who are in the hospitals were really um, are trying to deal with is um, ensuring that we can retain those folks also with the understanding that they also have many more options and they don't have to necessarily deal with some of these types of challenges on a day-to-day -day basis if they don't have to. Molly, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think they both hit on just the, the increase in turnover, people leaving the industry, and for those that are staying, higher rates of burnout. I mean, that's been a, a topic from a lot of the hospital associations I've worked with is people are just, they're burnt out and they want out. And I think not only do they have different options, but you know, I can think of one nurse, she worked 20 years and now she owns her own med spa because she was, she was just done. You know, she did now she works with only the patients she wants to. And, you know, that's 20 years of experience that we don't have in in a hospital anymore. Uh, one of the other uh, ripple effects that I think we talked a little bit about is just the just the massive um, suck on resources that this can lead to um, the expenses that uh, are redirected towards, you know, uh, workplace safety, which is important but also that can, that can detract from other areas of service. Um, is that, uh, well, we, we know that's a concern as well. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about that? Molly, let's start with you. Yeah, so I don't know the specifics of, of budgeting. I think maybe Claude or Abai might be a little bit better on that. But yeah, if, they're, if we're distracted taking care of, you know, patients and security concerns, then we don't have, you know, the resources to maybe give folks the pay raises they need or the benefits they need or, you know, the hospital upgrades that that would be important for folks. Yeah, go ahead, Claude, maybe you can talk about this, especially in light of the fact that, you know, we do know that especially during the pandemic, there was a lot of capital projects that were put off uh, for afterwards and how you've probably had to work with your team to prioritize um, more security measures uh, in light of the other capital needs that that you probably that are probably existing at Mercy. Yeah, hundred percent. I you know, and we're I think we're still um, working through coming out of uh, out of some of that. We certainly have had to set some things aside and um, some of that physical uh, security because again, it it costs quite a bit. And so, uh, yeah, post pandemic, you know, as as I think most systems are probably still trying to crawl out of that financially and reprioritize. Um, I think that's where we we pivoted a little bit here at Mercy to understand that, you know, with the basic information that we had in education and training and equipment, um, we we're still able to function fairly safely. But what we really needed to do was start to, to educate all of our staff as, as much as we could um, and increase the number of classes we were providing for active threat response and um, de-escalation um, to help them help us respond to um, all of those types of incidents because resources become thin, people are sick a lot, people leave in the industry, um, and we had to supplement that somehow. And, and the best way we found to be able to do that is to get people in some classes, um, re-educate on how do we how do we handle some of these escalating types of situations to prevent workplace violence. And I think that's one of the things that um, you know we we can put we put a lot of measures in place. I think to try to stop things from coming into the hospital to try to create safe spaces within the hospital when there is a, a violent attack of some kind. Um, but one of the things that I think needs to be focused on a lot more is the proactive approach to that, which is how do we how do we enter a space and 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 work through a process with a patient to make sure that they don't feel that way, that they need to to want to hurt someone or have that verbal um, uh, response turn into a physical response. And so um, I, I think I think we're we're doing a decent job here anyway of of reallocating some of those resources and finding some different ways grants and things like that to try to pick up a few of those pieces overall um, to 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 uh, help us out with some of the physical stuff. But um, really, I've I've been kind of hyper focused on 
education and education, you know, being present, getting out there and helping people understand how we can um, prevent things from happening um, before they do. But I, I just want to make sure you have a chance to jump in there on that uh, yeah. issue of expense because, um, well, and Claude just touched on it a little bit in terms of, you know, alternative sources of funding. Uh, as those expenses climb, the expense <clears throat> that is uh, passed on to uh, patients climbs and, um, you know, contributes to another of the main issues surrounding American healthcare, right? Yeah, look, uh, you know, uh, I think over 60% of the, uh, generally speaking, 60% of the revenue that hospitals generate are from, uh, you know, government payers, Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, the commercial insurers uh, generally, while pay a little bit higher, they generally, you know, tie their rate uh, or rate increases to the government rate or rate increases, right? So they, generally speaking, rates just don't really change all that much over time. And, um, but, uh, you know, I will say the, uh, thankfully, through the hospital directed payment program, I think that our hospitals now have um, some more uh, resources, which we're grateful for um, uh, right now. But, um, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, as Claude pointed out, those those uh, those funds are being used to make sure that our team members and our colleagues are paid uh, a fair wage. Uh, we all know about uh um, you know, inflation, and while inflation is slowing uh, considerably, it's still uh, there's inflation still exists, um, and uh, the cost of goods are still uh, higher than they were uh, several years ago. So I think um, when we talk about uh, resources that are provided to hospitals in the form of money, whether that's through grant funding or um, through you know their general revenue, um, you know the priority right now is to ensure that we're you know keeping people uh, for as long as we can. And so um, naturally, you could pay somebody more, but uh, there are lines to be drawn, and I'm sure Claude deals with this every day with individuals who are assaulted or uh, you know spit on uh, to say, you know what, you can't pay me enough. Um, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go do something else. So um, I think that that tension um, has always existed, which is why you know as we'll talk about Tony as we jump to solutions. As I mentioned, you know I think there are you have to attack this problem in several different ways. It's not just a uh, financial. Um, so there's not just a financial solution or a legislative solution, but I think we've got to work with uh, some of our other partners. And I don't want to steal your thunder as we transition to that phase, but no, um, you, you know I think yeah. that's why it's a multi pronged issue. You're you're right where I want you to be. Although I do, <clears throat> I do want to give Claude a chance to talk about some of those uh, some of those efforts that Mercy has really had success with. Um, you know, we talk about the the numbers trending the wrong direction. Claude, I understand you guys have actually seen uh, some improvement, which um, jumps off the page compared to most other facilities. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, again, that uh, when when you look at, as, as we were talking about the financial stuff, as you look at also how much it costs when someone does get assaulted um, and, you know, how much the hospital has to invest there to make sure that that staff is um, is OK and is taken care of. I mean, it's, it can be astronomical at times, and especially if, if it becomes a, a major trend. And so, again, we, you know, trying to think about, you know, the, the best ways to be able to drive down those numbers honestly for us has been um, engaging some initiatives that put us in front of uh, patients in what I call kind of peacetime. Um, you know, historically, I think you know, our security teams are called when there's a crisis and it's getting out of hand and now we need security to be there in order to control that patient or control that environment. And a lot of times that ends up with a hands-on situation, with the, which then almost always ends up with someone getting uh, injured, whether it's the patient or or, uh, or our staff. And so, you know, to kind of rethink that, one of the things or a few of the things that we've done are really increased um, our engagement education. And, and so one thing that we do here at Mercy, our security teams, they, um, when, when we have uh, patients that come in to our ED that we know um, have the potential to be on, on the inpatient unit with me or have some other type of uh, substance abuse issue or mental health crisis or behavioral crisis, um, we're one of the first faces that they see um, in peacetime, not when we have to go in and, and control, uh, because I don't I don't like us to, to control people, but to, to get in and introduce themselves, try to build a rapport, see what see what we can do to help them feel more comfortable in that space, 
have a short conversation, talk about the the, the transport to another space. I mean, all the different things, our, our security officers are really involved in that. And so we try to build that rapport right away um, in, a, in a nice way before we have to go in and, and have any type of authority presence at all. Um, that way, because we know that we're going to probably see them over time, um, it's a familiar face of some kind, you know, we act with respect um, and, and that tends to help quite a bit. That has been a huge um, help for us. We, you know, we keep someone down in our uh, ED for the most part, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and that's one of their jobs is to, to build that rapport. And then we extend that to um, things. We have a safety algorithm here where um, if, if that patient has had some history that maybe is flagged, they're going to go up to one of our inpatient units, medical units. Um, you know, we we have our house make a phone call, we get security, we get that that team a, a short huddle together and talk about what are the things that, you know, what here's what we know from what happened before. Not that that has to drive everything, but it's a piece of information that we have to say, um, you know, last time they they threw a bunch of stuff. So what can we take out of that room that doesn't become a projectile of some kind? How can we build the environment to to be a little bit safer? Um, what type of tech do we, if it has to be a one-to-one, -one, what type of tech do we ask? Um, you know, we try not to ask the 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 person, the young person that maybe is two weeks out of school to sit in a in a space where someone could potentially be aggressive or combative. Let's get somebody that has a little bit of a a, a, a better sense of how to build a rapport and talk to people and engage with people. Um, on our behavioral unit, same thing. You know, when patients come in, um, instead of moving ourselves away from the patient when they're when they're kind of having a crisis, let's throw a bunch of resources at that. Uh, at that patient instead and, and engage and stay engaged and, you know, provide some space for them to to, to be calm as best we can, but um, not to give up on that process of rapport building. And and overall, I think that has really um, been, a, been a great help. And, and part of that process, of course, is just the education. And, you know, when I teach those classes with de-escalation and kind of walk people through my approach to dealing with um, critical situations and active threat training and how do we respond and you know, yet sometimes I think you just have to look at people and empower them to to be safe. Because in healthcare, we want to hug people all the time, you know, and, and try to make them feel better. And and I think sometimes we we forget that not everybody responds well that way, and that we have to work ourselves into that space to make sure that it's okay to to do that. And so we talk about processes and medication administration, and how we can do those things safety uh, safely. Um, and our security team is a is a big help with that. You know, we're we're not there to to hold people, we're there to help people get what they need and 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 have a um, kind of a, an environment of cooperation. So, I, one of the other things that we discussed in um, in our pre meet was, uh, you know, Mercy is in a, a position where um, they can uh, invest in a security team. A lot of rural hospitals in Iowa are not in that position, or they're part of a network where. Um, you know, they don't have the resources to to delve in. Um, Claude, I know that you uh, go outside, you know, the main facility and are working uh, at clinics around um, around the network. But what what can those uh, smaller facilities do um, in addition to the kind of, uh, you know, thought that you're talking about putting into prevention and and um, care uh to deal with this yeah or what I, kind of success stories are you hearing sure i i really do think that um again just investing i think um for other systems investing in someone who um, can can kind of build a bit of a program of of walking into that space i mean what i do is i i do a physical assessment of the of the space of that clinic make sure one that we've got you know appropriate um division between our waiting areas and our clinical spaces that th those doors are locked so we don't have people that can just walk into the clinical space. Um, that That is one of the main things that we, we've done just as physical security is concerned. And then providing them all with, um, you know, information on how, how do we call for help when we're we're in a in a bad place uh, within that space? How do we, um, if we can use panic alarms, which might be a cheaper option than hiring security, um, how do we connect with our local law enforcement agencies to get them to to stop by frequently and and have conversations and then and then know hey if we're calling for this reason it's because we need help right away and you know to to consider that a, a crisis kind of a call um, but we have to get to know those those community partners you know we talk 
I talk a lot about that as far as, you know, we have places that are out in Tama. So we have a, a clinics out in Tama. I'm, I'm not going to make it there in time when there's an issue. And so um, we talk to them about partnering with some of the surrounding neighborhood air, um, businesses. If there is a, a major incident and, and people have to go someplace safe, then we create that partnership and, and relationship with them. Um, but, you know, they get annual education from me. Um, we get, uh, you know, I respond um, to whatever I can. I, I help talk to patients for sure. But I, I really do think that it's uh, our rural communities really have to invest in getting someone out there to their space to do that physical assessment, to have a conversation about um, here's a here's maybe a, a good way to approach um, uh, a uh, escalating incident. So what I've written for our clinics is kind of a, a go by, so to speak, that says, hey, if somebody calls the, the clinic and says, I'm really upset and I'm on my way, what do you do? And we have a list of things that they, a protocol that they can follow to do that. If someone's in the waiting room and starts to really become disruptive, what do you do? Um, if someone's in the clinical space with a, with a doctor in those, in those really small rooms, how do we set up that environment for success as far as being able to get out of that room and call for help? Uh, two to one care when we know that, when we already know that someone might have, you know, the last um, clinic meet did not go very well, or there was a threat. How do we now bring more resources initially to just to make sure that we're going to be okay? So there's just a lot of those types of things that we can that we can do to to build a feeling of safety um, that that I think um, our our rural teams should really focus on. And there's that transition that we were looking for into uh, partnerships and community partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, Abai and and Molly, do you guys want to chime in on that? Yeah, you know, one thing uh, Molly mentioned earlier uh, is that uh, she and I collaborated on some uh, training for our uh, members across the state this year uh, regarding workplace violence. Molly's uh, Molly kind of led off with de-escalation training, which I'll let her kind of touch on a little bit. And Claude has already talked about a little bit. But, you know, the way when I was thinking, you know, talking to members about this issue um, a lot of last year and earlier this year, uh, a lot of the issues that came up related to um working with local law enforcement and county attorneys and collaborating with them or sometimes a lack of collaboration. And so uh, as we're kind of trying to figure out here at IHA how we can best help our members with this, we really, we really saw an opportunity for us to, to help our hospitals connect uh, with our county attorneys uh, who are really tasked and elected to uh, enforce the law. And uh, as we all know, in Iowa, we have, just like every other state, an assault code, Chapter 708. Um, you can't go and hit somebody. <laughs> you can't even go up and scream at, scream at somebody. And uh, in fact, if you do that to people in certain occupations, like healthcare providers, uh, and that's a defined term in the, in the statute, the penalties are actually escalated. And so uh, one thing we did was connect with the County Attorneys Association, and we worked with them to have fireside chats uh, in all the areas of the state. So uh, members could hear from county attorneys in their respective areas about generally just what the law is uh, and how uh, uh, an assault case is uh, charged and, can, and, and tried. And, and most importantly, how county attorneys and hospitals can work together to ensure that the law is enforced. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the challenges there was that, well, was, was providing, overcoming, uh, sort of an obstacle of um, healthcare providers not necessarily wanting to call the cops on their patients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we all are in this industry because we want to help people. And um, I think it is really hard for Claude and any of his colleagues to have to call the police um, when somebody is um, acting, uh, frankly, illegally and uh, doing something illegal. But um, we also know that while that is not the ultimate solution, that is a solution. And that is something that uh, healthcare workers should understand that they should not have to put up with. And that is what law enforcement and county attorneys are there to do is to protect them. And I, I really want to give a shout out to our county attorneys we collaborated with who really, um, you know, stuck the landing there in, 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 in sharing that message um, that, hey, we understand there are a lot of folks um, with underlying behavioral health, mental illnesses who maybe don't know what they're doing, but there are also a lot of folks who do know what, what they're doing. Um, and those people should be held accountable. Uh, and so we talked a lot about how important it is for healthcare providers to, uh, you know, call the cops and, uh, and make sure that they are uh, part of the process in convict getting, getting a conviction. I mean, they're a witness. County attorneys talked about the resources they have to help 
victims and witnesses through the process um, and that they will work with them. Oftentimes, as Claude can can speak to being formally in law enforcement, the, the law enforcement officers help the victims through that process as well. Um, and uh, how the hospitals can really be be supportive of that. Um, so I think that that's one avenue we need to continue to pursue. I think something else, too, is that um, the, the provision in Chapter 708 that escalates the penalties for um, assault against people in certain occupations, and in this context, healthcare providers, um, was a little narrow. The definition of healthcare providers really came down to, you know, licensed providers, first responders, PAs, NPs, resident physicians, physicians, uh, and nurses, um, and so what we have, uh, what we did at IHA was actually proposed an amendment to that statute or had uh, the legislature consider an amendment to that. Um, that bill, uh, you know, got through a committee in the House last year, uh, unfortunately didn't make it much further than that, but that is something that we are uh, continuing to look at as the session approaches here in January to see how we can really provide the county attorneys the tools they need uh, to be able to prosecute these cases. So um, those are just a couple of solutions. And then I think finally, uh, what we are looking to is trying to figure out how we can really help our members uh, talk about this issue and let the public know that it's not okay to go anywhere and, and assault somebody, but especially in a healthcare setting where people are trying to help you, um, where Claude and his team are simply trying to help you, spitting at them, yelling at them, being impatient, uh, yelling at the at the front desk clerk who is just simply trying to do their job and get people through the door and to the back so they can get help is not okay, um, and it won't be tolerated. And um, and helping raise the raise sort of the the importance of the issue. So um, those are those are I think the a few of the solutions. Partnering up, how we can partner up. Um, I was at a conference earlier this year where there's one health system um, outside of the state of Iowa where they collaborate with law enforcement. They have law enforcement actually come in and round the ED every day. Um, and uh, they just have uh, somebody stop by to so they can let them know what's in their who's in their ED and um, what could potentially be problematic. Obviously, that is hard to do in some of our smaller uh, counties because um, they're relying on sheriff's deputies who are also spread very thin. But again, a potential solution and a way to partner with our law enforcement uh, to uh, try to be proactive about that situation, understanding they can't maybe stay there all day. Um, but, you know, just let them know, flagging uh, certain patients saying, hey, we, you know, just want to let you know that we have a patient here who's a little unruly. We might need your help down the road. Um, you know, little things like that could make a difference, especially when these are um, incidences that can ramp up in a matter of minutes. I think one partnership we haven't talked about yet um, that can save folks that consider remote is the Homeland Security Association. And so they will come in and similar to kind of what Claude mentioned, they'll look at your building and say, hey, do you need locked doors here? Do you need training here? What does that look like? And they provide that for free. So for our folks that don't have the, the funding, just reaching out to them, they can be a really good resource. One of the neat things that we did find when we were going around the, the state this year is that the way we structured the training, hospitals could learn from each other. So we really said, hey, what are you doing that works? What are you doing that hasn't worked? And so I do encourage, you know, hospitals and other security teams to, to reach out to each other. And when it comes to solutions, I also think we need to look at what are our partnerships inside the organization? So how is leadership at each level supporting security? How are we communicating to our folks the importance of reporting these incidents? Because like Abai mentioned, we know that these workplace violence incidents are severely underreported because folks don't want to do the paperwork, right? I've never walked into a healthcare and human service organization and someone's like, you know why I got into healthcare? Paperwork. It's great, right? They've already got so much paperwork. <laughs> the easier we make it to report and the, e the more that we remind them, hey, this is, this is why we need it. And not only that, we shouldn't just be relying on our security partners. We really need to train everybody from the front desk to the last person that sees the patient with you know, de-escalation techniques. You know, Claude mentioned education, education, education is so important. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And if I can real quick, I just to touch on something that I said, the, um, you know, one of the things that I think we've, we had a challenge with early on, and I think that we've hopefully have kind of resolved it is, is working with our Lynn County um, attorney, but um, but getting in front of, of that group and getting in front of the chief of police and and sitting down and kind of talking through what it's like being in in, in our ED and in our B, our mental health you know unit when when officers are called to 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 take assault reports 
you know, there's some specific information they feel like they need. And sometimes officers just don't understand the interpretation of the law very well, you know, and I, and I think partnering and sitting down and saying, okay, this, these are the things that we are experiencing and how can we help it be easier for our staff to, to be able to raise their hand and say, yes, I was assaulted. I'd like to make a report because that can also be a little bit intimidating to think that they might have to go to court or, or whatever. And then on the other side of that, sometimes having officers say, hey, I don't really think that this qualifies, you know, in the code. So we, we've had to educate our uh, county attorney's office uh, a little bit just on, on what we do. We've received some education from them. We've worked through the police department. And, you know, one of the, the major things that we've done, especially on our behavioral unit, where we do have some, we, we can have some major assaults. Um, and it's tough because they're also in a mental health crisis or there's also some type of other, um, you know, issue going on where it does make it hard for us to want to to have to call the police on on someone. But we always engage our physician. Uh, anytime we have those types of assault, we get them on the phone or whatever we need to do. Um, and then they help provide that additional um, support to us to say to law enforcement, uh, yes or no. Yes, this person absolutely knows what they're doing. And it probably is an unsafe situation and they probably need to be taken um, or no. And we'll start to work through, um, you know, other process, but that part there has helped us really streamline the process of getting someone up here from law enforcement. Uh, we say, yep, here's the, here's the written evidence that you need to say, they absolutely know what they're doing. Here's the video evidence, uh, you know, of what happened. And, and that's been great for us. So I, I would encourage, um, you know, systems to really have those, those, um, face-to-face -face conversations with those teams just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah, and one solution I didn't talk about I want to touch on, which is related to what Claude just said, was, um, you know, here in Iowa, we have um, what are called uh, treatment courts, and the judicial branch has created treatment courts. There are uh, mental, there are drug treatment courts, there are actually uh, veterans treatment courts, and there are also mental health specialty courts, and um, we have a handful across the state. In fact, there's one um, in Johnson County uh, that has shown some success in reducing hospitalizations for those individuals who are really, you know, going you know, in and, in and out of hospitals a lot uh, due to an underlying mental health illness. So one thing we've done is actually been talking to the judicial branch about how we can really support those courts, standing up those courts and how our, you know, our hospital partners can be part of the solution. Because, you know, I think our role here is to not just say, hey, there's a problem, but come up with solutions and work with partners, uh, collaborate with partners to in be innovative, um, which is exactly what this conference is all about. That's why we're here. Um, but I think that is something, an avenue. And, and, and if you look at the national data on those treatment courts, especially the mental health treatment courts, they can be very successful um, if folks can stay in them. Um, we have the providers to assist them. And so, you know, shout out to, to our judicial branch for uh, for having having those as an option, and um, that's something we'll continue to explore and how we can how we can support those initiatives across the state. That's that's great, and and we've talked uh, a lot about you know some of the public resources or public partnerships that are out there that are just imperative uh, to to make the connections on. But what about what about private? What about nonprofits? Are there organizations that um, Claude? I want to I want to start with you specifically. You know, locally, are there organizations that um, you have connected with that are helpful in this regard? Yeah, we so we have uh, locally here with the with another hospital in town, uh, Unity Point. We certainly have our Abbey Health uh, Center. That that assists with some of the community related issues, uh, and, and we certainly <coughs> partner with them, um, and they they help uh, upon discharge of some of our patients, help to provide some services, um, and, and we have a, a number of other places we you know work with our homeless shelters for our patients that you know really struggle with that. Our our social workers do a really great job here of reaching out across the state to find the resources that some of our patients may need, whether it's um, finding some work or housing or. Um, or finding another outpatient type of a service that really would fit them um, and, and what their needs are. Um, and so I, I, yeah, I think that those, uh, those, you know, partnerships are really, really important to, to make sure that you're maintaining and, and doing the best we can. And, and most of that is just because we don't have, um, you know, major residential centers that we can send patients to now that might be able to provide them with not only some safety and security, um, but also long-term mental health, mental health um, services. And so, that it has to happen in the community, which makes it difficult at times, you know, and we see a lot of this, the same types of, of patients because um, they get out in the community. Unfortunately, the community can be, you know, 
uh, there's a lot of pressure out there to to kind of maintain what they were doing that put them here with us in the first place. And so um, it, it's it's definitely a challenge, but I think we've got some really good community partners here that we that we make sure that we uh, maintain a good relationship with. Molly and Abai, your uh, perspective is a little bit more statewide. Um, are there other organizations that you can think of that have jumped in and, and helped healthcare facilities in this regard? You know, I, I, I think there are uh, a number of ways that we can collaborate with uh, nonprofit organizations on, on these types of uh, issues, wh whether it's um, training or helping with placement, um, um, you know, including, you know, organizations like NAMI. Um, and so um, I think, you know, our hospitals, as Claude has pointed out, are, are really trying to focus those, those type of solutions locally uh, to see how they can partner with their local nonprofits. And, you know, it's a multi-pronged issue. A lot of these patients, as we talk about the patients who are maybe violent, um, uh, but have underlying mental health diagnoses um, or don't have diagnoses, but, <laughs> but maybe need to be diagnosed, um, you know, the issues are, are housing, uh, food and security, uh, things like that. So leaning on your local partners, I think, is something that our hospital do a lot to help those individuals. So they can try to find, get a little stabilized. Um, uh, so they're, you know, taking their meds, uh, going to their appointments, holding a job. Um, so, uh, you know, shout out to the caseworkers and the social workers at, mm -hmm. you know, Mercy Medical Center and all our hospitals across the state who really have to take on that initiative and, um, and make sure that those folks are, are continuing down a path. So th I think, Tony, you know, from my perspective, uh, and as Claude pointed out, a lot of those partnerships uh, happen at the local level. Yeah, I would echo that too, just getting to know where, you know, who are your local mental health providers? Who are your local crisis response units? What are what are options that folks have, especially in those those rural areas? So I know I worked for years as a director of training for Optima Life Services, and I know in some of their smaller areas, they partner really well with the emergency room departments where they'll have the, the licensed social workers come in, do an assessment, and then work to partner with them and see, okay, what do they need going forward? Because as Claude mentioned, you know, we really went from, okay, you can have somebody living in, you know, residential facility for years and years and years. And then we pushed folks out to the community and they're, they're not sure how to adapt. And we also don't have enough waiver spaces for, for them. I think, you know, part of the solution to maybe decreasing some of these incidents is increasing mental health funding. I think that's at a, a broad legislative, legislative level, but that would be certainly useful. Solve a lot of other problems too, probably. Yeah. Um, um, okay. I first of all, I want to take a second just to remind our audience, which you guys have held your audience's attention really well. Uh, thank you for that. Um, but if you have a question, uh, feel free to submit it. Uh, Josh will relay it to me, and I'll uh, throw it out to the group. So please feel free um, as we near our kind of final 10 minute mark, I wanna make sure that we take time to talk some more about um, solutions that maybe we have not touched on. And uh, Abai, I know you um, have some have some thoughts in that regard. Yeah, you know, I think just going back to some of the things I've talked about before, I think, you know, really finding a way to collaborate with our partners who can really impact this is important. And so, I'll, you know, uh, at risk of sounding repetitive, I'll just, you know, sort of summarize before I think, you know, we have to work with our local law enforcement and local county attorneys. Um, and uh, I think they are all interested in finding ways to collaborate to help the solution. And, um, you know, in our conversation, some of them didn't realize how big of a problem it was. So it's our job as an association and as hospitals to speak up and talk about it. Um, I think uh, finding ways to collaborate with other uh, state agencies who have resources like the judicial branch uh, that has these specialty courts, uh, uh, one of them being a mental health specialty court that can maybe help uh, with uh, decrease uh, some of the uh, 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 maybe uh, patients that are going through the, in the revolving door that are in the revolving door going, you know, from the ED um, out back into society and then back into the ED. Um, so I think that's a partnership there. And then I think just partnering with the public to, to raise awareness about the issue, um, because I think the more people who know about it, uh, the better. And then I think that will also 
um, you know, uh, hopefully help some of our colleagues who are on the front line uh, uh, feel supported as well. Molly, other uh, solutions that we you feel like we've not touched on? I think a couple of things that we didn't really touch that much on, and this is one of the things that we covered with folks over the summer, is really looking at your workplace violence policy and procedures, and then looking at how easy is it for folks to report? What does your workplace violence committee look like? What does the training for your staff look like? What does the security presence look like? And just looking at it from a holistic Point of view. Um, I will throw out to folks, if they're interested, I can send people a, a PDF of the presentation that we gave all over the state. That's a free resource as well as a, a one pager that has just kind of some of the overall do's and don'ts of, of workplace violence, policies, procedures, committees, et cetera. That's great, Molly. And we can actually post that to the, um, the conference website as well. So please do share that. Yeah. Yep. I'll send that over. And I think that's really important. You know, what Molly, what Molly said is if, um, you know, I, I think sometimes we, we, we get into a, a space of um, attacking an issue as it comes, but maybe not building a long-term um, plan or solution in, in a workplace violence prevention committee, you know, maybe can help with that, bringing some people together to sit down to, you know, one, look at your reporting structure and, and what that looks like. So we use Midas here at, uh, at, at Mercy, but you know, encouraging people and, and letting people know it's okay to, to throw those things in, you know, into that system, no matter what, because there is a committee that is reviewing those. And we have people review those Midas reports every single day that, that push information to me as a security director or, or other people to say, hey, this looks like a trend that we're having either in this department or organization wide. And how do we attack that? And those are the types of things that we talk about in our, in our committee, which is how do we, how do we put those numbers together um, and then figure out what would be a plan of attack to, to start working on that particular issue? Because it seems like there's a lack of education there or a lack of resource there or something that, that we can push. And then, you know, it's important to then talk to the organization about what we're doing. And so we're, and we're working through that process now. And I think um, it, it's, it's heading towards being, you know, fairly successful. We want to let people know that one, we have a workplace violence plan and we have a committee that works on these things and we have policies and we want people to read those. And one of the things that I did recently was sit down with all of our leaders in the organization and 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 have them actually write out their workplace violence response plan. So here are the things that they, you know, upon orientation, they need to read all of these policies um, in the hospital that have to do with workplace violence and disruptive behavior and um, harassment and sexual assault and all those types of things. Know what those policies are when it actually happens, this is how you report it. Um, this is who you talk to about it. Um, here are the resources that you can have. If we have a COPE team here that responds, um, you know, real time for the most part to, to sit with people and say, hey, talk to me about how you're doing and, and what's going on with you. And, and we have some safe spaces for that. Um, but we, we, we throw those types of resources in, right? We're encouraging our managers within 24 hours, you know, because, you know, we, we're 24 hour op operations. Sometimes we're sleeping, things happen, you know, within 24 hours, figure out what happened, go attach yourself to that particular um, staff and, and make sure they're doing okay. Provide them with the resource um, information that they need um, if they need some counseling or some other type of help. Uh, but make sure that we're really um, providing that as quickly as possible to our staff so they know they feel supported. Um, and that the organization supports them. And so a lot of those types of things, you just you have to be intentional about and build. And, and, and I think Molly touched on that really well to, to say it's it's important. These are the probably the more important things that we need to do, even beyond some of the physical safety things, is that we have to make sure our staff feel educated, empowered, um, and, and know how to respond in these types of situations. And um, one, to keep themselves safe, but two, to make sure that the organization understands how to support them. Claude, can you, I'm just curious, can you talk, get a little bit more specific about how have you um, empowered your colleagues, team members um, to help them understand that it's it's not okay. You know, it's not just part of the job. You know, maybe some of it is, but like, you know, this level that we're seeing, um, how, how have you had those conversations to encourage them to report it so to, or, or be okay with calling the police or, uh, tell you about it um, instead of just, you know, saying, well, you know, whatever, it's just, I just got to deal with it. 
Yeah, I th I think um, for me it's just being really proactive and 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 spending a lot of time actually going to the calls for service and talking to people. That's one aspect of it. I certainly have sat down with our um, our C suite to make sure they understand my perspective on things and how important it is for them to put information out to the organization from that VP level and higher um, to to let people know. Um, here are all the resources that we have. Here's all the information that you have. And then, um, so that that in-person stuff, and then in, honestly teaching the classes. And so when I I offer classes, um, you know, I, I talk specifically about, um, you know, what our what our organizational response plan is to these types of situations, what they can expect from the security team when when they call, how they can call for help. We walk through all of those types of uh, of things, but also really empower them to understand that one, they're supported by the state, that they they don't have to stand. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people feel like they may lose their license if they don't respond or if they do something specific, you know, in active shooter situations or active threat situations or things where their life is being threatened. You know, and I tell people all the time, if somebody says they want to seriously hurt you, believe them and let's respond in a way that keeps you safe. Um, but also you will be um, supported by our organization when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and not only will you be supported, but here are the, the ways that you can call for um, proactive help. We have a behavioral emergency response team in our hospital. Um, when things are escalating, um, that we can bring a bunch of resources, security and our house supervisor and people from my staff um, on BHU to come and help de-escalate that situation before it becomes an aggressive incident. Um, and, and I'm sure everybody has their aggressive incident code calls and things like that. But I think getting in front of people consistently, and I do that with the clinics as well, to say um, it is not a part of the job for you to be assaulted. Things are going to happen because of the environment that we're in and because of the people that we're dealing with, but it's not part of the job and you don't have to, you know, so here's what you can know from me to help one, you be personally safe, as, as safe as you can be, knowing that there may be an incident that happens where you're going to get struck or, or attacked, but um, as quickly as we can, here are the, 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 the response you can expect from your team and let's build that empowerment within your team because not everybody is built uh, you know, like me from law enforcement and things like that, you know, where I feel comfortable in that in that type of a crisis space. So we have to talk about what who who really is comfortable um, engaging in a crisis situation to de-escalate a situation. We have people on our team that are really good at that type of thing. So let's send them to that that space to start working on that. How do we call for help immediately, and who do we call? Um, how do we engage our community law enforcement? How do we engage our security team? So. I just, I really think it's important, again, to sit down and be intentional about building those types of processes, getting in front of those teams and walking them through it. And then we ask our managers, our directors, um, you know, staff meetings, talk about it at staff meetings, you know, let's go over the response plan, quarterly trainings, um, you know, making sure that they have access to come listen to me talk about de-escalation techniques and things like that. And so that's, uh, I, I think that's part of the build and hopefully I'm, I'm answering your question there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. For I'd love to echo with something that Molly said real quick. Just, I also am, I, I love teaching. I would be more than happy to come out and, and either, you know, help with assessments or have conversations or, or classes or, you know, just, just talk about that type of stuff with anybody's team anywhere. It's just one of the things I really like to do. So. All right. We have just a couple minutes left. If anybody has any closing remarks, you, you do have time, but uh, keep it, keep it tight. Uh, I'll just say thank you. It was great to collaborate with Molly and Claude on this and uh, appreciate, uh, obviously, the Gazette for making this a, a topic and and, ele and elevating it uh, and giving it the attention it deserves. So thanks for doing that. Now, thank you all. I, and I don't want to cut you guys off, uh, Molly or Claude, if you want to say something. Thank you all for, for making time for this today. I know... Uh, uh, you're very busy and we pull you away from other priorities, but we're really uh, grateful to have your expertise. Um, I do want to uh, just give a shout out or uh, prompt to anybody who is following the health track specifically. Uh, in about six minutes, we have another monstrous topic, uh, cancer in Iowa that is coming up. So. If you want to follow along with the healthcare track, you can you can fly over to that one. Um, Zach Kucharski has Mary Charlton, uh, Dr. Mark Burkhard, and Dr. Ann Stroh. I want to thank you guys specifically. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a great conversation and um, hopefully helpful to those who joined us. Thank you also to our audience, and uh, I wish you all a happy Iowa Ideas.
Thanks, Thank Donnie. you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you.